You know that we have a policy that people are not, parishioners are not to put out literature, invest in the old church without first having it approved. And pretty much all of our priests, I'm sure, have that policy, as I do in Salem, New Hampshire, and Oakland, Maine, in our churches. Sometimes people who are well intentioned come across something that looks devotional, that looks interesting, and they'll make copies of it and not put it out. Well, that happened recently in Maine. There's a new man who started coming, very devout man, but he was promoting something called the 15 Secret Tortures of Our Lord. There's a list of 15 things that supposedly were done to our Lord uh, between his arrest in the garden, uh, in the house of Caiaphas, when our Lord was imprisoned there overnight until they sent him until they took him to the uh, to Pilate to condemn him. And so this was called the 15 Secret Tortures. And I removed all of them. I didn't know who put them out, made an announcement, and he spoke to me and wanted to know why. And so I did a little research and explained it to him. But it's interesting that the church has condemned a number of private devotions like this that are um, fanciful, I guess you might say, especially ones that seem to or claim to have a knowledge of tortures of our Lord. And uh, there's an interesting one that was particularly condemned by Pope Leo XIII. And, and this is part of what it said. Uh, be it known, this was revealed to a nun, supposedly. Um, matter of fact, uh, it claimed the leaflet, this is what this man put out, but this is something else that circulated. A leaflet promoting that this devotion claimed to come from Revelations to St. Elizabeth, Hungry St. Matilda, and St. Bridget, and claimed that it was approved by Pope Leo XIII in 1890. Actually, it was condemned by Pope Leo XIII in the decree of May 26, 1898. But this was part of the devotion, the claim, the revelation, the private revelation. Be it known that the number of armed soldiers were 150. Those who trailed me while I was down were 23. The number of executioners of justice were 83. The blows I received on my head were 150. And it goes on like this, and it's just all this numbers and details. Uh, another false devotion that was condemned had to do with the number of drops of blood that I will shed on his way to Calvary, or in the course of passion, he gave you know, some thousand certain number. And so it's just this, in a way, perhaps it appeals to crime to know something that's not known otherwise. And an interesting thing is that Pope Benedict XIV in the 1700s, who wrote uh, a treatise on beatifications and canonizations and laid down uh, the requirements that subsequently were used for the application canonization process, one of the things he said in that decree is that sometimes even a canonized saint who had a true private revelation could end up inserting his or her own thoughts into the recounting because these mystics who had private revelation, they were not protected by the Holy Ghost as were the writers of Scripture from um, writing down accurately without error, because sometimes, again, their own imagination and their own ideas could creep in. Uh, another one that was condemned was called the sh uh, devotion to the shoulder wound of our Lord, like he carried his cross on his shoulder, and so that this was supposedly revealed to St. Bernard and approved by the Eugene III, but again was condemned. The general theme of all of these types of revelations is an obsession with having privileged information, knowing things that not everyone gets to know, and also with a fascination, often, with depicting cruel tortures. Nothing, nothing like this has ever been approved by Rome. Usually, such false revelations claim origin from some saint and supposedly approved by some pope, etc. And a lot of times you get these leaflets and they will say, uh, approved by church authority. They don't say what bishop or what pope or what.
of the year, etc. And uh, uh, you know they claim that in Vermont and so forth. Uh, so uh, it's interesting that this this good man who had come across this leaflet of the 15 secret tortures and made copies and put it out, and then was told what the ruling is, asked why, and after I explained all of this, he very humbly and uh, obediently submitted and said, I'm glad to know that, I didn't realize this. But this is a book with uh, Karen Bravo that has uh, decrees of the Holy Office, which is the Holy Office, normal times, is right under the Pope, and it is the group of cardinals and theologians, etc., that are to make judgments pertaining to things pertaining to faith. So, uh, this is one, this is a decree. Uh, 1937, May 26, 1937, and the title of the decree is New Forms of Worship or Devotion Are Not to Be Introduced. And I'll just read a little portion of it. Uh, it says here, so many grave warnings and injunctions of the Supreme Ecclesiastical Authority have thus far failed to obtain full obedience. In fact, as everyone knows, these new forms of worship and devotion, often enough ridiculous, and usually useless imitations or corruptions of similar ones, which are already legitimately established, are in many places, especially in these recent days, being daily multiplied and propagated. So this was 1937 under Pope Pius XI, because you know with printing now these these types of things can be easily propagated. But you know that in canon law, not only a book but even a leaflet cannot be printed pertaining to the faith that has not received any provider from the order. And, and even like the holy picture could not be printed without the approval. It's very strict. Uh, Paul VI did away with those. But furthermore, we don't have ordinaries in the dioceses. There's heretics in the dioceses, claiming to be the bishops of those dioceses. But we don't have bishops that we can go to who have ordinary authority um, for the Vermont. And so nowadays, so many things are printed or reprinted, and we do have to be careful in this regard. So I'll just read a few of these other ones. Here's one condemned in 1934, the practice of the 44 masses. And it so happens there was a group of religious in Poland who had started this novel devotion of what was called the 44 masses, by which they claimed that any soul for whom 44 masses were applied in any way and at any time while the person was still alive would be freed from purgatory on the third day after his death. And that kind of is uh, reminiscent of, if you've ever read the, the so-called 15 Promises to St. Bridget, and uh, one of them was those who recite these, there were 15 prayers in honor of passion, and if you recite them every day for a year, supposedly 15 of your relatives would be delivered from purgatory, 15 of your relatives who are, you know, not in the state of grace of sins would be converted, and all of these other promises. Again, totally spurious. Um, another decree, 1939, the Holy Office was asked whether it is allowed to encourage among the faithful the forms of devotion commonly called the devotion to the annihilated love of Jesus and the rosary of the most sacred wounds of our Lord. The reply the eminent cardinals in charge of safeguarding faith and morals, having in mind the decree of May 26, 1937, that new things are not to be propagated, decided to reply it is not. Allowed, is not permitted. Approved and published by order of his holiness, Pope Pius XII. Well. And this, I have other ones that I uh, marked, but I mean, it, you get the point. So, uh, so this is one of the reasons why we have the rule that people are just to put things out without, if it's in the church, in the vestibule, uh, for people to take without having it approved, even if it's like something political, whatever it may be. Um, so there, there's good reason for that. But this brings us to the question then, what do we know of our Lord's passion and what can we meditate on? Well, obviously, there are the four accounts, Saints Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We read them beginning on Sunday. So Palm Sunday is the passion according to Saint 
Matthew. Tuesday, of Holy Week, the Gospel is the Passion according to St. Mark. Wednesday, St. Luke, and Good Friday, St. John. So we have the accounts of the Passion. We can read about that, meditate on it. Also, many saints had the custom of just taking the crucifix in their hands and just looking at the crucifix and reflecting upon it. You've heard the, the story about how St. Thomas was once amazed at the beautiful things written by his contemporary, St. Bonaventure. St. Bonaventure was a Franciscan and St. Dominic, a St. Thomas, a Dominican in the 13th century. So St. Thomas once visited St. Bernard and said, where did you find these things you wrote here in this book? And he showed him his crucifix and said, right here, by meditating on the crucifix, is where he came up with the beautiful thoughts that he wrote. And his crucifix was all worn away in the gilding was the tears he shed and the kisses that he used uh, for his crucifix to meditate and just holding it, gazing at the image of our Lord and meditating on the passion. But one last thing I would like to mention is that we also have the Holy Shrine of Turin. Now I've read extensively on the Holy Shrine and have no doubts whatsoever that it is authentic uh, for a number of reasons. One interesting proof is that an expert professor who studied pollen and trees and so forth did some scrapings on the shroud and there was some pollen from plants or trees that don't grow anywhere except in the Middle East. So how did that get on the cloth that's preserved in Turin, Italy? But to me, the most striking proof of the authenticity of the shroud is that for those who have seen it, it's uh, not necessarily very uh, impressive just to look at. And nobody knew why until the 1890s when an Italian man was given permission, was a photographer, to photograph the shroud. And when he developed the negatives, or developed the, the place, he saw in the negative the image of our Lord. And it just, it just overwhelmed him because he was the first one to see it. Now this is interesting. How could a forger of the Middle Ages, which is those who don't believe in the authenticity of the shroud, say that it was painted in the Middle Ages? Well, how could a forger from the Middle Ages, long before the time he was invented, have painted a perfect photographic man? Because uh, if you look at a picture that's a negative of the shroud, it gives you the positive image of our Lord. So that to me is a proof par excellence of the authenticity of the shroud. But at any rate, many years ago, when I was in the seminary, and I read the book called A Doctor of Calvary. And if you've never read it or familiar with it, this man was a surgeon in Paris named uh, Pierre Barbet, I believe was his name. And he studied the shroud and the images of the on the shroud. Now, much of the book was technical and medical terminology, a little bit um, dry. But towards the end of the book, he has a chapter which is a meditation, which he takes all that he learned and, and describes the passion of our Lord. But several things that, that I remember from reading that book many years ago. One, he emphasizes that the crown of thorns was not like a circlet of like a wreath, uh, that type of a crown, but rather a cap. Like a, like a helmet. Because on the shell, there are all over the head puncture wounds from the thorns. Another thing that he mentions, I thought was very interesting, was that he noticed on the wrist of our Lord, on the, the forearm, two distinct blood flows. And the reason for that is when a person was crucified, he ended up dying of asphyxiation, which is why they broke the legs of the two thieves. But our Lord was already dead when they did that. But a person who's hanging on the cross can't breathe, so he pushes up from the feet and can breathe and then sinks down again by, by the pain and so forth. So this constant uh, natural reaction of trying to get a breath and pushing oneself up is why the blood flow were these two distinct angles coming from the wound. And another thing is that the wound is in the wrist, not in the palm. 
And if it weren't the palm, it would have torn through the, the hand. But in the wrist, there's a conglomeration of bones that all come together. And this doctor, the surgeon who wrote the book, actually experimented with that, with that driving a nail through that point in the wrist. And those bones separated, and the nail went through those bones, which could then hold the weight. But another interesting thing that he found by doing this with the cadaver, as soon as he drove the nail into the wrist at that point, the thumb would immediately go into the hand. And if you look close at the shroud, you don't see any thumbs. You see other one's hands, but there's no thumb. Because there's a nerve there that forces the thumb automatically to, to retract into the palm when the nail is driven there. So those are just some, some interesting things from this book by uh, Dr. Barbet on, based on the shroud. And another thing that he described was what the, the flagella, what the lips were like, and even the like little balls on the end of the of the whip because of the markings on the shroud. And of course, if you look to the back side or more of the shroud, it is just covered with wounds. And there are those little marks from this uh, like ball bearing. Yes, a pair of them at the end of each uh, lash of, of the whip. So let us reflect on our Lord's passion, as we should during passion time, by making use of the accounts of Scripture, the crucifix, and just reflecting upon it. And of course, we have the image of our Lord on the Holy Shroud. A good meditation book you can get on the passion will simply explain or give you a meditation based on those sources. And we have to be very careful with these private revelations that someone might uh, might try and tell you, you know, this is was revealed to this saint or that saint. The church has always been very careful about those. But we have all that we need to understand what our Lord suffered and by reflecting upon it to express our deep love for him.